guys will join me for more word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, as always, uh, for this time that we got to uh, worship you, Lord, and songs of praise. We thank you for that. I pray that you just be with us at this time, that you may speak uh, through primarily your word and secondarily uh, through the sermon, Lord, that I've prepared for us today. We love you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, everybody. So last week I mentioned that I- I've been trying to think for a while what two final sermons I wanted to leave you guys with, and that after a while of thinking about it, uh, I decided to leave us with some fundamentals, right? So last week, we spoke about the nature of Scripture, right? How Scripture is God-breathed and inspired, and how it's the sole infallible rule of faith for the church. However, we also made it clear that knowing the Scriptures means nothing if we miss the Christ that is contained within the Scriptures, right? And if we ultimately miss the Gospel, then we miss the whole thing. And so today, we're going to cover a foundational topic that undergirds the Gospel and really is uh, the foundation of the gospel, right? And, and this is a topic that we need to get right in order to get the gospel right. And that's the two kinds of righteousness. And so the core truth that I have for us today is that there are two different kinds of righteousness in the Christian life. One kind that is before God and one that is before man. And so uh, a graphic that I, I put together, uh, copying another graphic I saw online that, I, that I hopefully will be able to help us a little bit, I know it's a lot. I'll read you what it says on there, right? So you have you, right, in the center, at the bottom. You have God up top, and you have uh, other people and your vocation, your job, whatever it is that we do in life on the sides, right? And so as you can see on this graph, there are two kinds of righteousness. There's one kind of horizontal righteousness that we also refer to as active righteousness, and there's a vertical kind of righteousness between us and God, right? So you have a righteousness that is horizontal between us and other people, and one that is vertical between us and God. And they are very, very different. And in fact, the gospel, our our ability to understand the gospel really falls on whether or not we understand the difference between these two kinds of righteousness. And so before I move on, and we'll talk about them uh, individually, just the thing that you can see on the graph to help you remind you. So uh, uh, they have different names, right? uh, Passive or vertical righteousness, or righteousness quorum deo, which we'll talk about in a second. And that is a righteousness that is passive, It is imputed, it is given, and it is the gospel. And we have another kind of righteousness, the horizontal righteousness, that is quorum mundo, which we'll talk about what that means in a second, and that is active, you're active in it. Uh, You exercise it through your vocation, through your job, through your roles in life, being a parent, being a husband, being a wife, being a brother, being a sister. And we think of law when we think about this kind of righteousness. And so our first truth today is that according to the law, we exercise a kind of active righteousness. This justifies us before people. And so this horizontal kind of righteousness between us and uh, and other people, like we said, is called active righteousness or horizontal righteousness. When we refer to this righteousness being quorum mundo, as is Latin, it just means before the world or before the eyes of the world. So it's according to this kind of righteousness that we are justified before the eyes of other people. Right, I, I, I like, uh, and that's why you can see it right here. It's just horizontal, right? I take it one at a time because they're, they're two separate kinds of righteousness. And so it's between you and other people, according to the law of God, according to the law of the land. And so a quote from Martin Luther, uh, we'll, we'll lean on Luther quite a bit during this because Luther was uh, one of the first people, if not the first, uh, I think it was the first in church history, that lays it out using these terms. And he lays it out very clearly. And so he defines it like this. He says, there is a political or civil righteousness Emperors, the princes of this world, philosophers and attorneys must deal with this one. There is also a righteousness of social behavior, according to human traditions. Parents, as well as tutors, may teach this type of righteousness without fear, since they do not attribute to these types of actions any satisfaction for sin to please God or to merit grace. They teach that these types of behaviors are only necessary to correct bad habits and certain observances regarding social life. Parallel to these, there is another righteousness, called the righteousness of the law, or the Ten Commandments, taught by Moses. And so the reason this horizontal righteousness is also called active is because, well, we're active in it, right? As Luther points out, kids are active in it when they obey their parents. Citizens are active in it when they obey the laws of the land. People are active in it in general when they obey cultural behaviors and traditions that are handed down that justify them before the eyes of the other members of that culture. And the Israelites and everyone after them, right, is active in it when they obey the Ten Commandments of God. And so when we think about horizontal righteousness, we need to think of law, God's law, the law of the land, the law of the things around us, law of good order. And this is a law that people can kind of begin to figure out because as the Bible says, it's kind of ingrained deeply in our hearts as people. Even if we've never even heard of the gospel, if we've never heard of the Bible, we've never heard of Christianity, 
we're able to piece some of these things together. And you see that throughout history, right? In every culture all over the place, you look at especially even the ancient Greek philosophers, and people can start to piece together, okay, what are the best ways to live in this life? What are some of the natural laws of the world out there? What are some ethical laws? What are some good ethics and other uh, philosophies that we can figure out that are good for living? And these are things that we can start to piece together, and then we see them more fully laid out in the Ten Commandments, in the law of God, the things that God expects of us when we live in God's world. And so let's look at a couple of examples of scripture mentioning this kind of righteousness. We have, for example, Deuteronomy 16, 18 through 20. It says, you shall appoint judges and officers in all your gates, which the Lord your God gives you, according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality, nor take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. You shall follow what is altogether just, that you may live and inherit the land which the Lord your God is giving you. So this is just one example, right? We're seeing the uh, Lord helping them set up uh, judges and officers to judge righteously. And so that's one, of the, one example, like we said, of political horizontal righteousness, right? Where by my right actions, I am justified before the eyes of the law, the eyes of the judges, the eyes of uh, the people that are around me. Another example we see with the government, Romans 13, 1 through 2. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. We see that phrasing in judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. Or in other words, right, we do what is good, and we will be justified before the eyes of the local authorities. Right? And so what we're getting at here is the Lord is setting up this kind of horizontal uh, sphere. We have, this, we have this sphere where Scripture speaks all the time about the things that we must do. And when we think about God's law, that's what we need to think about, what we must do, what we're required to do. That's why we're active in it. We've been given instructions. We need to follow through on those instructions. That's what the law does. It gives God's requirements, and it expects the fulfillment of those requirements. And while there are many places in Scripture that speak of this righteousness, and this kind of righteousness is spoken of positively as it regards our living in this life or having a peaceful life, being able to set up an inheritance for our children, being able to live peaceably with other people in the land that we're a part of, because it's a requirement and God is perfect and his requirements are perfect, it cannot justify us before God. And so truth number two is that we do not have a perfect active righteousness according to the law. Therefore, the law condemns us before God. And so we're going to read here a few verses along those lines in Romans chapter 3. What's going on, just for a little bit of context in Romans, is Paul is writing to this community that we believe is a mixed community between uh, Jews and Gentiles. And you have uh, the Jews in this, in, in this area who are uh, doing what, what kind of happened a lot in, in the apostolic age, which is they keep saying, well, you know, the Judaizers roll into town, these teachers that say, hey, in order to become a Christian, you must first become a, a good Jew, and so you need to get circumcised, you need to keep kosher, you need to do these different things. They've shown up, like they always do, and so Paul is reasoning uh, with uh, his fellow Jews, right, because he's, he's Jewish himself. And so he's been building up for the past couple chapters, right, talking about how the Jewish people have been given uh, by the Lord, right, the commandments, they've been given a special favor from the Lord, how the Gentiles have not received this, and he talks about how, you know, well, if you could follow the law, you could be righteous in the law. And it's, it's almost like he's setting up this trap where they're saying, yeah, you're right, Paul, if we follow the law, we can be righteous in the law. And then when he compares, finally, the Jews to the Gentiles, he says this, what then, are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin.
And so we see Paul here uh, engage this trap, right? The trap goes off. He's like, oh, yeah, but here's the law. The law is so, oh, man, it's so, it's so awesome. It comes from God. It tells us how to live. And if we follow it perfectly, it can, it, it, we can be righteous before God. Isn't that great? And it's almost like he's wanting his, his readers to be like, yeah, you're right, Paul. That is great. Well, too bad none of us can do that. Right? That's the conclusion here. That, that's the trap that Paul sets. And he's going to spend the rest of the book unpacking that and unpacking what that means and how it is that if we cannot have a perfect act of righteousness, how we can be made right with God at all. And so before we can talk about how we can be made right with God, it's important that we understand why it is that our act of righteousness can't make us right before God. And so think of it this way. God is the embodiment of goodness. God isn't good like when you call something else good, you're making reference to some other kind of standard. God is the standard. God is literally the embodiment of goodness. He is goodness. So therefore, because nothing else besides God is, well, God, right, then whenever God calls something good, well, we'll use it for this example, like good with a capital G, like God's good. When God calls something good, he's speaking of a derived goodness. He's speaking, he's speaking of a goodness that is measured by how that thing or that person or whatever he's talking about reflects his own attributes. Because he is goodness. Right? So if something else is going to be good, it's because it's reflecting who he is. Because he is the standard. And so if God deems something good, capital G good, then that thing wholly reflects his own attributes. Right, it wholly reflects his intended purpose that he built it for. And the thing in question must do so perfectly because God is perfect. God is perfection. And so if God forgot to look at something and say that this thing is actually, in, in, in an ultimate sense, this is good, that thing must be perfect. Because if in any way it's missing the mark, if in any way it's missing even just a tiny bit of the design that he has for it, even if in any way it is missing the mark by, by an inch, it is no longer perfect. It is no longer meeting that standard. And so a, a capital G good thing, a thing that is ultimately good, is anything that aligns with God's perfect and just standard. And likewise, evil, right? Evil is not its own thing. Evil is a privation of good. Evil is when something is devoid of good, of goodness. Then evil is defined as anything that does not align perfectly with God's perfect and just standard. And so given that for something to be good in God's eyes, it must be perfect, Nothing that is imperfect, no matter how much it's trying, no matter how much uh, progress it's made in the direction of goodness, if it hasn't met that perfect standard, it is not ultimately good. As human beings, however, because of our dis distorted understanding of goodness, because all of our minds are, are distorted by sin, we tend to qualify things and actions that we believe to strive toward goodness, and we look at that and say, oh yeah, that's good. That, 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 like, we, we assign capital G goodness to things that I, I would call little g goodness, things that are striving toward the general direction of what God wants. And we tend to look at that and we go, yeah, that is good. But the issue is that actions are made up of two things. They're made up of the action itself that we're doing, right? So if I pick up this water bottle, there's the actual picking up the water bottle. But there's also my intention to pick up the water bottle. And so I, I can do something like pick up this water bottle, and if I had a good intention for it, I, it could potentially be a good thing, or if I had a bad intention for it, it could be a very bad thing, depending on why I'm picking it up. And the Bible thus tells us, uh, I should have put this verse on the screen, but I forgot to add it on there, that anything that is not done in faith is sin. And why is that? Because the Bible tells us that there are two commandments that sum up all of God's law. That is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your strength, with all of your mind, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And there are times where, you know, we may strive to love our neighbor. We may even do so like we do ourselves uh, every once in a while. But if we don't have faith, we cannot love the Lord our God. And we can't do it in the way that he requires. And so everything that we do without faith, everything that we do without Christ, is actually bad. Because it's missing the standard completely. It's not even close to the standard, right? If, if you get a 50% on something, you failed, right? And so it's failing. Because we can't love the Lord our God without faith. And even when we love our neighbor, we do kind of a horrible job at it most of the time. Every once in a while, we may do something a little bit self-sacrificial, but most of the time, it's tainted with jealousy, it's tainted with ignorance, it's tainted with being self-seeking, with, oh, I'm going to get something out of this. And so everything that we do is tainted with sin. Even the best of the active righteousness that we have to offer completely misses the mark. Because we're either failing to love the Lord our God completely, or we're failing to love our neighbor completely. Completely. 
And because remember, God is perfection. His standard is perfection. We mess that up even once, and it's game over. And in fact, because Adam and Eve, as, as, our, as the, the, the heads of humanity, when they made the decision to sin in the garden, they messed it up for us too. And so in sin, we have our own sins that we're actively doing, but likewise, we have a sin that we inherit, that we're just born with. A sin that, that we didn't even do anything for it, but it's given to us through Adam and Eve because they made a decision on our behalf. And so game's over on both accounts, right? We're born and the game's over already. We've lost. Our act of righteousness cannot keep up with the law of God. And so while the law of God is good, it shows us things about God, attributes of God. It shows us things that he would like us to do, the design that he has for us. Ultimately, the law of God only serves to crush us lest we receive help from God. Because the law of God, like a mirror, like the scripture says, it shows us how evil we actually are. When we look into the mirror of the law, it shows us how dirty we are because we can't keep it. And the more that we try, maybe we clean ourselves a little bit, but then we end up pouring a lot more dirt on the next day. And so as Paul writes in this verse, right, in verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped. That the world may become guilty before God. The law shows us how to live, but it also shuts up every mouth. It shuts up the mouth of the Jews that were uh, bragging over the Gentiles in Paul's day. It should shut up my mouth and your mouth. It shuts up all of our mouths because we fail to be perfect. If we look at the law of God and we look at it honestly, we'll realize that we've failed. And because God is a righteous God, he's not just all loving, although he is that, he's also all just a God who is a just judge cannot just sweep things under the rug. He can't just say, oh, you know, I mean, you messed everything up and you did all kinds of evil in my sight, but eh, we'll just forget about it. It's okay. There's a punishment that corresponds with evil that God as a just judge needs to dole out. And so that brings us to our third truth, and that is that in the gospel, we receive the passive righteousness of Christ through faith. This justifies us before God. And so we'll see here in that bit of the graphic, right, this kind of righteousness that we see, you know, going uh, downward from God, right, it goes by a couple different names. It goes by the name of passive righteousness uh, or vertical righteousness. We'll talk about why that is in a second. Another name for it is alien righteousness, not alien like, you know, an extraterrestrial or whatever, but alien in the traditional use of the word. It's outside of yourself. It comes from, from somewhere else. An alien righteousness and it is a righteousness that we refer to as quorum Deo, or before the face of God. So quorum mundo, before the world. Quorum Deo, before God. And this kind of righteousness has nothing to do with our righteousness in the world's eyes. It has to do with our righteousness in the eyes of God. And so notice the direction, too, on the graph, right? It's not pointing from us to God. It's not even pointing both ways. It's pointing exclusively from God to us. And that's because in the gospel, the difference between law and gospel and scriptures, the law tells us what we must do. The law tells us what God requires. The gospel is the promise of God. They're the promises of God. The promise that we see in scripture. But they're things that they're, it's a gift that the Lord gives to us. And in that way, we're completely passive. We're not active. We're not working for it. It's being given to us. Uh, I like the way that Martin Luther says it, because the fascinating thing about this kind of righteousness, like I just said, is that it's given to us as a gift. And that gift is the righteousness of Christ that clothes us on Judgment Day. And so this is the way that Martin Luther puts it in, in his uh, introduction on the commentary, uh, uh, in his commentary of Galatians. He says, but this more excellent righteousness that I say is of faith is this, God through Christ, apart from any work of our own, puts it freely to our account. It is not political or behavioral. It is not the righteousness of the law of God. It does not concern our works, but exists on a different level. It is a simple passive righteousness, since all the previous ones are active. To obtain this one, we don't do any work at all, nor do we offer anything to God. Rather, we receive only and allow another to work in our behalf, none other than God himself. And so before we read any, uh, any of these verses that I have here uh, uh, that support this point biblically, uh, let's understand what faith is. Because if we're talking about this kind of righteousness, and we just defined it, it's the righteousness of another. It's the righteousness of Christ. Uh, in interestingly enough, it's Christ's active righteousness. Christ who is fully God, fully man. Because 
Whereas we lost the game right the moment we were born. It was over for us. Christ didn't lose the game. He pitched the perfect game. He followed God's law perfectly. And because he followed God's law perfectly, died the death that we deserve, took our punishment that God as a righteous judge needs to give out for sin, and then rose again on the third day, he can give us his righteousness. But what's interesting here and what's really important is that we receive this through what we call the empty hand of faith. The hand of faith that is devoid of works. The hand of faith that needs to be empty if it's going to grab on to something. That's something being the righteousness of Christ. And so it's important that we define faith. Uh, I like the way that the, the formula of Concord uh, defines faith. It says this, We believe, teach, and confess that this faith is not a bare knowledge of the history of Christ, but such a gift of God by which we come to the right knowledge of Christ as our Redeemer in the word of the gospel and trust in him that for the sake of his obedience alone, we have by grace the forgiveness of sins and regarded as holy and righteous before God the Father and eternally saved. And so as we read these verses together, I want you to keep this definition of faith in your mind. Faith isn't just, oh yeah, I believe that you know, Christ did come in history and I believe that even God is real and he acts in history. Living faith is not just an assent to the facts about Jesus and God's activity in history. Living faith is the acceptance and the personal appropriation of the promises of God. Or rather, it is not just the intellectual assent that those promises are historic and that God made them out there somewhere and they're real out in the ether. Faith is the appropriation of those promises. It's the belief that they are real and that they apply to you. Demons have the kind of dead faith that is a mere acceptance of facts. I mean, demons are walking, they know that God exists. They're engaged in war with angels all the time. They have a dead faith, as the book of James tells us, right? You know, James says, uh, oh, you say that you believe in God, you do well. Even the demons believe and they shudder. The demons believe facts about God out in history, but they don't have any promises of God to personally appropriate to themselves. Nor do they want those promises. So they can't have a real living faith. And so once we understand that faith is the, the personal appropriation, the, the, the just believing, that switch that goes on from one moment to the next, where, wow, I believe that God did that, and I believe that he did that for me. Here's what the scriptures have to say about the role of that faith and justification before God. Philippians 3, 8 through 9. Yet indeed, this is Paul speaking. Uh, and, and for context here, right? Paul has just gone on this, on this uh, long explanation of all these things that he did so amazingly under the law. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He had a zeal for, for God's law and his people like no one else had, right? He was keeping the law. He was blameless before the eyes of other people. And yet he says this, Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. And so notice, Paul is including all these things. He's, he's done all this boasting up until this point. Again, almost setting up a trap. Paul really likes to do this. He's setting up all this boasting so that maybe someone that's reading this who, who boasts in those things says, yeah, you're right, Paul. I do all those things too. And yet he says that he counts all of those things, including his own righteousness from the law, to be worth absolutely nothing. Our translation here is very nice, saying that he counts them as rubbish. The original word literally means that he counts them as excrement. He counts them as dung. They're nothing to him. They're, they're worse than nothing. They're worthless. And so these things that he was previously bragging about, these things that can you know, justify us in the eyes of people, people look at us and they go, wow, Paul, you really are a Pharisee of Pharisees. Wow, Paul, you really do your best to keep the law of God. Wow, you're awesome, Paul. You're not even breaking the law. At the end of the day, he has to count all of that as dung, as nothing, if he is to have Christ Jesus. Because keep in mind that analogy that, that we were talking about earlier, the empty hand of faith. If the hand of faith is full and carrying all of these different works and these different things of merit that I think I'm going to bring before God on Judgment Day, my, my church attendance, uh, how well I kept the Ten Commandments, or how well I tried, how nice I was uh, to my family all those times, and, and, and if I'm busy carrying all of this, I can't grab onto the righteousness of another. I'm busy with my own stuff. And come Judgment Day, all of this will do nothing for me. All the church attendance, 
all the praying, even if it's even all the reading of God's word, if I'm trusting in my own ability to have kept these things, they will damn me come judgment day. They're not going to be worth anything. And so because they're not worth anything on judgment day, when it comes to my salvation, just like the Apostle Paul, we need to be able to say, these things are worthless. They're rubbish. They're dung. They're nothing. And they're nothing not because they're bad, not because God's law is bad, because God's law is good, but they're nothing because I have the righteousness of Christ that is perfect, that cannot be subtracted from or added to. And I first need to drop all of this and to see it as worthless so that I may know to drop it. So that in the, em- the empty hand of faith, I may grab on to my Savior. And so this, we see in this verse, Paul, Paul uh, talks a little bit more about in Romans chapter 3, where he says, But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood, through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, notice this part, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. And Paul goes on with this, right? In 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 the next chapter, he says this, What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. And we'll pause right there. Notice he's saying you don't have anything to boast about. If this was all about us, if it was about how, how... perfect of a game I can pitch as a Christian, how amazing I can be as a father, in my, or how amazing I can be at my job and my vocation, how much I can show up to church. If it was about me, if it was about you, if it was about us, then we'd have something to boast about. Because there's always going to be another guy that goes to church less than you. So there's going to be somebody else that is a worse father than you. So there's going to be somebody else that is doing X thing worse than you. If, it was, if getting into heaven was about our works, then we would have something to boast about. But Paul says it's excluded. And he talks about Abraham as an example. Because Abraham, before he was ever circumcised, before Abraham had you know, picked up his family and moved out, and, 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 and we get the Old Testament, uh, uh, Abraham on, kind of kicked off right, the, the nation of Israel. Before any of that, God shows up and he makes a promise to Abraham. And God promises him that he's going to give to him a land, that his descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky, as the grains of sand on the beach. And notice what we said earlier. The law are God's requirements. They're things for us to do. Gospel is God's promises. Things that God tells you, you just believe them. And so here's what Paul has to say about Abraham. If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are counted as great, not as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, and this is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, because notice this example, because sometimes people, uh, uh, unfortunately, when you look at some of these theologies that that include merit, that include works, I mentioned last week, and part of the reason I'm quoting Martin Luther so much, this is one of the big issues that we see in something like Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy, where yeah, God's grace is great and it's cool, but I need to synergize with it. I need to do things. I need to earn merit. I need to do all these good actions that will earn me increases in justification before God. Yeah, sure, maybe the beginning is is free, but from that point, it's up to me to hold on to this baby. It's It's up to me to keep this thing and keep it growing by whether it's doing nice things to people, whether it's uh, under some of these systems, by praying to saints, by uh, denying myself of pleasures, by doing all these things. I got to keep this thing growing. And that cannot stand up to the argument that Paul makes here. Because he says, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. And that's only logical, right? When you go to work and you clock in, and you work for for two weeks, and you know, oh, payday comes up. If your boss comes up to you after you've worked uh, uh, 40 plus hours, right, and he says, hey, listen, uh, here is your paycheck, your unmerited gift that you did not earn from me. 
you'd be upset. <laughs> and rightfully so. Because it's like, well, this isn't a gift. I clocked in. I worked for this. I earned this. And so what Paul is pointing out is, to him who works, the wages cannot be grace. They cannot be a gift. It would be like debt. It's, it's a wage. And this is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. And so here we have that logic. If you're not working, right, to him who does not work, but instead believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith, his personal appropriation of the promises of God is accounted for righteousness. Not because that faith is such an amazing work. Not because that faith has a bunch of merit. It's such an amazing golden work that took so much effort that, wow, it's really worth the wages you're getting. Faith is nothing. It's believing the words of another. It's believing in the works of another. In this case, the works of God. And because there's no merit to be found, it removes boasting. And that faith is accounted for righteousness. Not on account of how good that faith is, but on account of the goodness of the promise that that faith is grabbing onto. So we're made righteous, not because we're so good and oh, I get to boast, I chose to have faith. God gives us faith even as a gift through his word. It's a gift that God gives. God flips that switch. He gives us the gift of faith. And all that that empty hand of faith does is hold on tightly to the righteousness of another. And so this brings us to our final truth of the day, and that is truth number four, because before I show you what it is, we may be tempted at this point, just like Paul himself anticipates this, this uh, counter-argument in his letters as well, but we may be tempted to say, oh, okay, I get it. So active righteousness comes from, to me from God. Direction is, goes in one way, from, from God to me. I believe in God's promises. That's awesome. And active righteousness is dealing with other people. They don't intersect. They're, they're two different directions. Oh, so if I'm good with God, I can probably do whatever I want. That is normally where, where, where a lot of people end up going. And Paul himself anticipates that. And he deals with that because that's just not the case. And not only Paul, but everybody else in the scriptures. They deal with what is the interception between, or not, not the literal interception, but how they, they, they affect each other, active righteousness and passive righteousness. Because active righteousness cannot diminish or add to the passive righteousness of Christ. But once we receive the passive righteousness of Christ, that then frees us to increase in active righteousness. And so truth number four is, once we've been justified by the gospel, we are now free and fully equipped to love and serve our neighbor through active righteousness. And you know, before, before we flinch, well, but I thought we didn't have righteousness. Remember, active righteousness is our righteousness before other people. It's our righteousness in the world. The way that, uh, uh, I think it's Luther uh, himself also says it, like, God doesn't need your good works, but your neighbor does. And so here's what uh, Peter has to say in 1 Peter. Uh, he says, therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, notice, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries, in regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins." Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability with which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so we see these two righteousnesses, a horizontal righteousness, and our vertical righteousness, our active righteousness, and our passive righteousness. 
Because here's the thing, when we are saved by faith, we are right that we are saved by faith alone, faith apart from works. We are saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. And what we mean by that is that while faith is the actuator for salvation, the empty hand of faith is the thing that results in our salvation when we grab on to the righteousness of another, once we do that, once, once the Lord regenerates us so that we may do that, we are given a new heart. And that new heart now frees us to do good works. It desires to do good works, and it can do them in a capacity that it could not do them before, because now we have faith. Remember that 50-50 that component? Before we had no faith, so all of our works were automatically 50%, they were done. But now because we have faith, the Lord can help us to love him and love our neighbor. And so while that faith, right, uh, empowers us to increase in active righteousness, just to be clear again, that active righteousness does not save us. It's a fruit, as the Bible always speaks of the fruits of the Spirit. It's a fruit. It comes from somewhere else. It comes from a seed, right? And the seed is faith. And this is the fruit that always comes from that seed. And so we can do works that we couldn't do before and in ways that we couldn't do them before. By faith, we can now use our talents to serve our neighbor sacrificially in ways that prior to Christ we would not have seen any reason to do. Right? You see all those people on the, on, on the graph right there? We are now free to serve them and to do so self-sacrificially. You see on the other side, our jobs, right? whether it's uh, what we do, our vocations, what we do at home, whether we're a parent, whether we're a son, we're a daughter, we're a brother, we're a sister. By faith, we can serve in that vocation faithfully. As husbands, we can choose to love our wife self-sacrificially as Christ himself loved the church that he was willing to die for her. As wives, by faith, we can now submit to our husbands as the scriptures tell us to do. And we can do so in love. Not, not for any uh, capricious reasoning, not for any, but it's a joy to do so. If our family is all, if we're, if we're saved, if we're functioning now in our act of righteousness with faith, we can now all serve faithfully in the roles that are given to us by the Lord. By faith, we can also serve in our jobs. We can do so in a hardworking fashion, right? Whether we're farmers, whether we're lawyers, whether we're whatever it is, the Lord has a plan for our vocation. And we can now do so honestly and faithfully. When people want us to be dishonest in the way that we're doing things, we are now by faith free to be honest with people in a way that maybe we didn't have an incentive to do before. Maybe before we had the incentive to be dishonest with our work because, oh, you know, it benefits me. But now that I have faith, I want to glorify Christ. And so now I have a transcendent motivation, a special motivation that I didn't have before that allows me to be active in the world in special ways. By faith, we can now love our neighbor. We can forgive their faults in ways, in ways in which we had no motivation to do before. Because now we can keep in mind, by faith, that God has forgiven us, and he's forgiven us of a lot. And he's going to keep forgiving us of a lot. And so by faith, we can now forgive our neighbor in a way that we couldn't do before. And so a saving faith always produces good works. After all, that's what the new proclivities of our new heart that we're given lean toward. So while they do not serve as the actuators or the actualizers of salvation, good works always accompany saving faith. And so as I, as I bring us here to our conclusion, I want to read one final uh, quote. I said we're going to lean a little bit on, on Luther <laughs> in this uh, situation. Uh, it's not on the slideshow. It's kind of long. I'll just read it to you. Uh, and this is how Luther kind of sums it up as he's going through his introduction on his commentary to the book of Galatians. He says uh, about these two righteousnesses, quote, We'd rather imagine, putting it simply, two worlds, one belonging to the heavens and the other belonging to the earth. In each, we place one of these two types of righteousness, far apart from each other. The righteousness of the law belongs to the earth, and it has to do with earthly matters, and on its behalf, we do good works. The earth cannot produce any fruit unless it is watered from above, and it yields fruit due to what comes from above. For the earth cannot decree over the sky, nor renew it, nor govern over it. On the contrary, it is the sky that judges, renews, and brings fruit to the earth, so that it will fulfill God's decree. It is the same with the righteousness of the law. Even after having done many things, we've accomplished nothing. But when we think we have fulfilled the law, we haven't fulfilled it at all, unless first, without any merit or work of our own, we are justified by this Christian righteousness, which has nothing to do with the righteousness of the law, that earthly, active righteousness. However, we do not have in us this heavenly and passive righteousness, as it is often called. Rather, we receive it from above. We don't work toward it, 
Instead, it already has worked on our behalf, and we cling to it by faith. That is why we are able to soar way above all law and works. Therefore, just as we carry the image of the earthly Adam, as Paul said, let us carry the image of the heavenly, which is the new man in a new world. Here, there is no law, no sin, no remorse, no guilty conscience, no death, but rather perfect joy, righteousness, grace, peace, salvation, and glory. Thank you.